gotta understand that we get one chance, one chance. Yo, you will never regret the things that we'll do. Cause I, 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 I wanna drive through the summer night. And when we. Hey, what's your favorite way to read a book? Mine is definitely a hardcover book in my hands, reading it, taking my time, underlining, copying, all that good stuff. But this year I discovered that if I listen to audiobooks, I might not get as much out of them, but I can listen to way more and still get some good stuff out of them. So ultimately I feel like I'm getting more good stuff than if I was only reading books with my eyes um, that were right in front of me. So I set a goal for 2023 to read 20 books. And this year I read 44 with the help of audiobooks. Um, and I'm pretty proud of that. I had a really good reading year. So I want to share about some of my favorite books that I read this year. But I'm going to start by sharing the one that I liked the least that I finished. I do not finish every book I start. There are plenty I know I put down this year, but I can't even remember what they were. Uh, once I close them, I'm like out of sight, out of mind. But um, I think it's always helpful to know what book somebody really dislikes, like Tuck Everlasting, Watership Down. <laughs> if you don't like those, or if you do like those, I should say. I'm probably not the person to continue listening to right now. My least favorite book for this year was disappointing to me because I think I had really high hopes for it. I know I had really high hopes for it and that was the problem. So I'll just tell you, it was Love Your Life, Not Theirs by Rachel Cruz. I am not one of those people that can't stand Dave Ramsey. I think he's pretty wise and has a lot of good stuff that you can learn from him. Um, but this book just felt like straight plagiarism from him. Um, I just felt like if it was anybody beside his daughter who had written this book, that like, there's no way they legally would have been allowed to. It just felt like such regurgitation of everything that he says. And I was disappointed because I was just really hoping for... A different perspective and she kind of okay so she gives a little bit of a different perspective but on all of the exact same points and so I don't know I don't know how to explain it except that it felt like I was just reading another Dave Ramsey book but not as good <laughs> so take it or leave it I would give it two stars because there was still good valuable things you could learn from it I just did not enjoy it so if you absolutely, totally, completely loved that book, then you might just want to skip this video unless you want to hear about some books that you might hate. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> um, some fun facts. I'm currently reading 15 different books. Six of them are on my Kindle. I uh, are not on my Kindle. They're Kindle like books that I'm reading on my phone. Um, those books, I have so many because I just take like little bits and pieces and read them over a really long amount of time. So there will be books in there that I will probably be reading for years. Um, I'm reading One With Thad. This is besides my Kindle books. One With Thad, two from the library, two for book club, two read alouds with my kids, and I'm listening to an audio right now the breakdown of what I'm currently reading. I'm not going to share any of those books right now, except for maybe one, because today is December 30th. Actually, it's after midnight. Today is the last day of 2023, December 31st. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to finish any of those books today. So if they're really good, then I will share them in a video for 2024 books. You'll have to wait a whole year to hear about them. Some of them will absolutely be shared next year. They're very good. Anyway, moving on. I like to be reading in about eight different categories of books that I created. <laughs> um, 
I just like to have a large scope of books that I'm reading. You'll see that most of them are nonfiction, but I do enjoy some fiction. Actually, I enjoy fiction, but I don't think I'm recommending a single one. No, that's not true. I have some, some read-alouds. Okay, I'm just going to get into it. The first category of books that I like to read are, I call them Christian. These are kind of based on my, like, quote unquote job titles. So my first hat that I wear is as a Christian. Um, let's see. I only have, no, no, no. I have two books. I have two really good books that I read in this category. The first one was called Psalms for Trials by Lindsay Tollefson. This book had incredible range and depth. Um, we are going through a season of infertility and this book totally spoke to me in that, but I also feel like it could have reached and had an impact on people going through all kinds of different um, trials. It was really, really, really good and I would highly recommend it. The second book that I loved in my Christian category was a Christmas devotional. It's called He Rules the World, a holly jolly collection of Christmas devotionals for everyone by Ben Zorns. This book um, had 25 different categories for, or 25 sections for the 25 days leading up to Christmas. I just listened to the entire, it was only maybe like an hour and a half, two hours. Um, just last week. So I was getting ready for Christmas and I had a lot of stuff to get done and I just wanted something Christmassy to set my heart right as I was getting all this stuff done. And I found this book. Um, it was so good. So, so, so good. I would like to really buy a hard copy and go through it nice and slow one day at a time next year. But I want to read you a quote from it. Ben said, the pagans were trying to get back to Eden the way we all do, by their own superstitious works of self-righteousness and worldly philosophy. However, the only way back to the tree of life is through the tree of Calvary. And at Christmas, we remember that the child born in Bethlehem would one day hang upon a tree for the forgiveness of our sins which is why we ought to celebrate with gusto. I love this quote because I have been really convicted this season. In the past, I would love the idea of a very simple Christmas. Um, I tend to be a dreamer and want to go all out with things but I have realized that I can't do it all and I need to cut back so that I'm not super stressed out and trying to do things last minute. Um, <laughs> I definitely dreamed too much this year, but my heart was in a much better place this year. I just was very convicted in the fact that Two things, like he said, that it's because Jesus was born to die, to save us, that we celebrate Christmas. And I have been working really hard to let my joy be the witness, the testimony, and that we get to celebrate Christmas. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful thing because Jesus saved us. So that's one. Two in the whole light of wanting our children to grow up, to want to come home and want to spend time with us when they're older. I think it's really important to do Christmas right now, to have traditions throughout the year, but especially at Christmas, that one day when they are out of my home and, you know, if they're not having a good Christmas, if you imagine, um, the prodigal son. <clears throat> when he was at a low point, he thought, 
you know, even the servants in my father's household live a better life than this. He knew that his dad knew how to do things the right way and have a good life. And I don't ever want my kids to be eating pig food, rolling around in mud, but I do want them to look back and think like those were good memories and I want to recreate those for my family and I want my family to be a part of those traditions and um, that kind of general idea. I hope that makes sense. So that book was really good. I could say more about it, but I will go on. My second category of books is wife slash homemaker, my second hat that I wear. Uh, the first book that I'm going to recommend is called Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Matthew Walker. This book <laughs> probably doesn't sound like a marriage or homemaking book, but I read it because my husband's a firefighter and he doesn't get to sleep very much um, or get good quality of sleep because he's interrupted in the middle of the night quite often. And I just wanted to read it and maybe get some helpful tips on how to get better sleep, like for when he is at home. I can't say I necessarily got that. It's not that there weren't good tips in it, uh, but that's not what the book was about. It was a lot of scientific studies explaining the benefits of sleep. And that was really fascinating. I will never look at sleep the same way. In fact, <laughs> looking at the clock right now, I should probably be sleeping instead of making this video, but what are you gonna do? All right, so moving on, the next book in this category that I thought was fantastic is called Married Sex, A Christian Couple's Guide to Reimagining Your Love Life by Gary Thomas and Deborah Fileta. This book, I would recommend to everyone. Honestly, I think every married couple should read this. It was really good. Just overall, nothing. I mean, obviously the category was sex. The topic was sex. But the book was fairly general and yet very solid. Really, really, really good. Uh, let's see. The next book I have, this is more on the homemaker side. It's called How to Manage Your Home Without Losing Your Mind by Dana K. White. This book was fantastic. Dana's hysterical. And if you, like me, ever feel like you are a creative but also cluttered type of person, this book is probably for you. I started listening to Dana's podcast, A Slob Comes Clean, years ago, and I have learned so many good things from it that have helped me. Um, for example, when you are picking up clutter, start with trash. It's very, very simple. If you're like overwhelmed by a room full of clutter or a house full of clutter, go around and just pick up all the trash and then go through again and pick up all of the easy things, the things that are like, I know exactly where this goes. If there's a dirty sock on the floor, put it in the hamper. If there's a cup on the table, put it in the dishwasher. Simple, like there's no hard thinking with that stuff. Then after all the easy stuff is done, go back through and the things that like, when you look at it, you don't immediately know where it belongs. Those are the things you put away last. So they take the most brain energy. That's a tip from her that I've been applying every single day in my life for years. And she talks about it in this book. It's really good. I highly suggest it. Moving on to my last book in this category. It's called Making Ideas Happen. Overcoming the Obstacles Between Vision and Reality by Scott Bilsky. If you haven't caught on, <laughs> I don't have a ton of organization naturally. Um, but there was an idea from this book. It's, it's not written for homemakers. It is definitely written for more of the corporate world, but I still got a lot of good info out of this book. 
And one of the core ideas that I will take away from it is the idea that you can be 100% creative, totally, completely, super duper creative. But if you have zero organization, 100 times zero equals zero. Your productivity level is zero. However, if you take somebody who's half as creative, 50, and, so, and multiply that with just a little teeny tiny bit of organization, two, 50 times two equals 100, much more productive. So if that resonates with you at all, this book might be helpful or it may not. That was truly the like best idea. I also learned a lot about dreamers and doers and how we complement each other. And it's not a bad thing that I'm a dreamer or that somebody else might be a doer that we actually get more done together, which I did enjoy that too. So I, it was a good book. I would say it was a good book. Category number three, <clears throat> I call this one mommy slash teacher. The first book I would recommend is another one that I would say is for everybody. This is a book I would and have now give for baby shower gifts. It would be a book to read while you're pregnant, maybe even before you get pregnant. This book is really good. Finally, read Risen Motherhood, Gospel Hope for Everyday Moments by Emily Jensen and Laura Whitler. We went to our friend's wedding up in Virginia in April this year. And the Airbnb that we were staying at had this book. I was so excited when I saw it. We were only there for, I don't know, maybe like three or four nights. So I knew I had to hustle to get it read, but I did. And it was totally worth it. It was so, sorry about that. Not sure where it cut me off. My phone storage is full. I had a podcast on my phone taking up over 10 gigabytes of space. It's gone. Um, I was talking about Risen Motherhood somewhere, somewhere about our Airbnb, I think. And now I had to read it super fast, but it was wonderful. And I would now recommend it to every Christian mommy in the world. Uh, let's see here. My next book. Oh, this one again might not sound like a obvious one for this category, but it's called Eat Dirt. Why Leaky Gut May Be the Root Cause of Your Health Problems and Five Surprising Steps to Cure It by Josh Axe, aka Dr. Axe. This book is in this category because we're trying to have a baby. So, um, you know, reading about different health things and whatnot. This book is now the reason why I drink kefir smoothies make my own kefir. Lots of progress this year. There was some really great information in this book. I would highly recommend it to many people. And I have, I could not stop talking about it while I was reading it. But specifically, I mean, like, similar to the Why We Sleep book, it had a lot of uh, scientific studies broken down in it. But this author does a really good job of making it interesting and coordinating it with his personal stories as well as helpful advice. It was, if he could write the sleep book, that would be cool. But he did not. He wrote the gut health book and it was fantastic. Uh, and yeah, now I drink kefir. And I barely even knew what Kiefer was before I read this book. So the next book in my mommy slash teacher category is called Why Children Matter by Douglas Wilson. There were a lot of fantastic concepts in this book that are very countercultural. But I just wanted to share a couple that have still stuck with me even months after reading it. I can't remember exactly when I read it, but two things. One, a world of yes. 
we should be giving a kid, our kids a world to live in of yes, where most answers are yes. And he even talks about how uh, even if you're giving your kids a no, you should give them a yes to turn to. So just like, it's not like I haven't heard that before, but the way he explained it was really good and helped me just to be more aware of that, that I want to provide a world of yes to my kids. So that, and then the second thing is efficient spanking. Uh, and if you want to read more about that, read his book. Moving on to Mr. Doug Wilson's wife, Miss Nancy Wilson. I read Praise Her in the Gates, The Calling of Christian Motherhood by Nancy Wilson. This book, I didn't agree with every single thing in it, but I did agree with the most, and it was still also very convicting. Really convicting as a wife and as a mom. I wanted to read, oh, I'll probably read both quotes. Okay, let me read the first one first. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I wasn't planning on reading it, but it's too good not to. And when I say it's convicting as a wife, you understand exactly what I mean. Here, right here. Does your husband come home to the wonderful aroma of dinner coming out of the oven? Or are, these, or are there unfinished piles scattered about the house, unfolded laundry and dirty dishes, bad smells in the refrigerator and in the bathroom, mold in the corners, beds rumpled and unmade, and toys spread from stem to stern. Yeah, reading that over and over and applying it over and over. And then the quote that I wanted to read you specifically was this one. No matter how many children the Lord may give you, be it two or 12, you must rejoice in the number and be fruitful in the rearing of them. So as somebody who has wanted 12 children all of her life, literally have said that, love Cheaper by the Dozen, the book and the movie. Um, and I have two children right now and have not been able to have more. This certainly hit home. Uh, I, it's been a topic of discussion a lot between me and Thad, just being joyful in what we have and appreciating what we have. And I, I think there's definitely a lot of both and that can happen there, but this was just such a precious quote. I now have two or 12, uh, what is it? Two or 12 rejoice and be fruitful on my letter board in our living room. And that has walked me over to it and pointed me to it before because I need that reminder sometimes. So it's a good reminder. I can't remember, I think there's another book I'm reading right now that kind of applies and they talk about just the shift between saying I have to, to I get to. So when you're up in the middle of the night with a baby, I get to, I get to, I don't have to, I get to. Um, when you are washing dirty laundry, I get to. When you're holding a very sleepy whiny child, I get to. Those are all super helpful things, but that quote is just really special to me right now. Uh, and then moving from Doug and Nancy to their daughter, Rachel Jankovic. There, I have heard her name pronounced so many different ways. Sorry. Loving the Little Years, Motherhood in the Trenches. This book was full of fantastic analogies. Uh, I have some quotes, but... I'm going to skip it and move on. All three of these books, the uh, Why Children Matter, Praise from the Gates, and Loving the Little Years, I would love to reread again and again and again. They are that good. So there you go. Finally, my last book in this category, Habits of the Household, Practicing the Story of God in Everyday Family Rhythms by Justin Whitmill Early. The end of that title perfectly describes this book. 
practicing the story of God in everyday family rhythms. There, <laughs> I am going to read some quotes from this book. I can't help it. Just, I just have to. So I have this one ready though. Let's see where to start. Habits are kinds of liturgies. They are little routines of worship and worship changes what we love. This one was a quote that he said he and his wife use whenever a kid spills something. He said, even if it's through gritted teeth, that's okay. Why don't you help me clean it up? I know that's so simple, but to have that script in your head is also so helpful. God, please parent me so I can parent them. The family for better or worse, is a formation machine. Our best parenting comes when we think less about being parents of children and more about being children of God. We can't make disciples without being disciples. Are y'all catching on to why I love this book? <laughs> so good. I think this is my last one. Oh, two more. The difference between people who happen to live together and families who befriend each other are rhythms of conversation at mealtimes. Finally, we wish for a different world because we were made for a different world. Just so good. I'm looking to see if there's any more. No, that's it. So good. Definitely, if you have a goal of your children growing up to love God and like each other, I would add that to your list right now. It's basically what my friend told me. She said, you need to read this right now. <laughs> and I'm glad I did. All right, moving on to my next category, number four. I call this one family slash friend. It's not mom or wife. It's like extended family members. So daughter, daughter-in-law, granddaughter godmother, and then also friend, neighbor, that kind of thing. Hope you get the picture there. Uh, I have three books for this category. The first one is called, This is Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live by w Melody Warnick. This book was everything I hoped it would be. I had high hopes for this book and it was fantastic. It, if you want to or want someone else to love where they live, then you should absolutely read this book. I read this book when I was hoping that my brother would move back here and stay here and he recently bought a house here. So maybe it helped. I don't know. It just gives a lot of fun facts and little stories and practical advice. That seems to be what I really like is like a good story, a fact, and application. Kind of sounds like a good sermon. <laughs> um, so yeah, this book was fantastic. One of the things that they suggest, I'll give you one that she suggests, is doing fun stuff, no way, uh, in the place you love or in the place you want to love. And I have a theory that there are just a few things that you could say are to credit for siblings who grow up and like each other. And one of them, I would say, is that they're able to still do fun stuff together, have done and still do fun stuff together. So it makes sense that doing fun stuff in the place you live might also build an attachment there. So tonight we went and looked at Christmas lights. So let's think. These were some of the things. We did a fun thing. We went and looked at Christmas lights. We did it with my parents. So we did it with people we love, which is also another way to build place attachment is to not only get to know the people there, but do stuff with them. And then and I may be mixing this up a little. It's been a long time since I've read this, but general idea. And then it was outside, which is getting outside is another thing. 
we went to a local, or like a very specific local place. I think that kind of goes in line with do fun stuff. Like it's something, I don't know, maybe not. That might be more another one. We ate at Steak and Shake in Kilwin. So those aren't local eateries. So that doesn't really count. But we built a lot of place attachment through other ways tonight. So that's just a quick example of some of the ideas in that book. All right, my second book for this category is called Face to Face, Meditations on Friendship and Hospitality by Steve Wilkins. I don't have a lot to say about this book, except it was long and wonderful and just such a holy perspective, such an eternal and holy perspective on friendship and hospitality. It was really good. Finally, sorry, <laughs> finally, uh, just open the door. This was the last book I read. Just open the door. How One Invitation Can Change a Generation by Jen Schmidt. This book was wonderful. I loved the whole thing. I have a friend who I always joke and tell her that her spiritual gift is inviting people to do things. And I wholeheartedly believe that that is a ministry in and, in and of itself to make people feel welcome and to open your heart and your home to them can make not just an, a difference for a generation, but an eternal difference. I totally believe that. I've seen it. And this book testified to that. Next category. This one I call fun slash fiction slash memoir. In other words, a story of some type. I didn't specifically intend to read any books in this category this year. I just didn't get to it with like the book club and library priority books and all that good stuff. But um, when I read the married sex book, we were going through like a thing in our mom's group at church where we were talking about sex. And so I was reading a bunch of books about it. And this one I read... And it could totally apply to the marriage category, but it was a really good story more, I would say. It's called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot by Mo Isom. I would absolutely give this to my teen daughter if I had one. The biggest idea, okay, so I'll just tell you, like, it kind of follows her throughout her journey, starting as like an eight-year-old kid, I want to say, um, all the way up into a few years into her marriage and just a lot of different life seasons, I would say. Um, and most people could probably relate to her in at some point in one of those seasons. But one of the ideas that I just loved was that she talked about how God calls us to purity, not virginity. And if that piques your interest at all, you should go read the book. It was really good. Okay, I'm starting to lose my voice. I need to finish. Oh, this is a good category. Number six, read alouds with my boys. So Gavin and Landon are now six and four. They were five and three at the beginning of this year. And we got through a number of books this year that were great. Like we read some good read alouds this year. So the first one and the very first book that we finished this year was the 12th book in the Imagination Station series. It's called Danger on a Silent Night by Marianne or Mariana Herring. Um, I enjoyed it. The boys thought it was a little creepy at times. It had a lot to do with King Herod hunting down Jesus. So there's like a mystery sense to it. Um, and my kids are not huge on anything scary at all. But I think it would have helped. This was our second Imagination Station book. I think it would have helped if we had started from the beginning. <clears throat> they weren't super into the characters because they didn't totally understand the whole like teleportation thing. So 
if you are going to read those to your kids, I'm, I'm hoping that mine will pick them back up for themselves to read one day because I did really enjoy the two that we read and there's like, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them or something. Um, but I would definitely suggest starting in order, at least with the first couple, I've heard that it kind of explains the, the situation and how things work better if you start from the beginning. The next series that we read, we read all of them. It was the Lulu series by Hilary McKay. The first book in the series is called Lulu and the Duck in the Park. I am not an animal person, but I thought each of these books, which have to do with a different animal and a girl who's obsessed with animals, were adorable and hysterical. These books were just a delight. We loved them. They look very girly, and the main character is a girl. Actually, there aren't many boys at all. There are some boys, but it's mostly about the main character and her cousin. Um, and like I said, they look very girly, but my boys loved these books. They thought they were great. So I would really recommend those. I know I keep saying that. I'm sorry. That's got to be annoying by now. I would suggest skipping the third book in the series. Sorry, I didn't write down what that one's called. But the third one, it was fine. Not terrible. But she just had a lot of like, she was just disrespectful to her grandma a lot, especially. And it was never addressed. It was just kind of ignored or laughed at that she was being rude and disrespectful. And I didn't love that. So nothing too crazy. Just I would have skipped it if I had known. And if I ever read them again, I will skip it. This could be my favorite book I read all of this year. It's possible. Jotham's Journey by Arnold. I have no idea how to pronounce his last name. It's spelled Y-T-R-E-E-I-D-E. -E -E. So... Y triad, E triad, I'm not sure. This is a book that is set up to be an Advent reading. So there's one reading for every single day leading up to Christmas, starting with the first day of Advent. It's really neat. Oh, I should have grabbed the one that we have to show you. It's neat because in the back of the book, you can look up the year that you're in and it tells you what day Advent starts on and like I think maybe what day Christmas and Christmas Eve fall on that year. Um, so you know exactly when to start reading it because that's actually how it describes it. It says like this chapter read the first week of Advent and it tells you like the first candle of Advent or the first the first day of the first week of Advent then the second day of the first week of Advent it goes on. We started this book as a school read aloud last year, so I wasn't reading it every day, and we quickly fell behind because it was longer chapters than I realized it would be, and again, just the dreamer in me was trying to do more than I could, so I don't know that we finished it until, I don't know, January, February, March, but it was really good, just heart-wrenching. It is a fictional story based on the true event of Jesus' birth. And it follows the story of a 10-year-old boy who made a bad choice and got separated from his family, but is desperately trying to be reconnected with them. They think that he died and have moved on without him. They have no idea that he's still alive. Meanwhile, there is a bad person chasing after him and trying to get some information from him. It's just, the book will make you laugh, it will make you cry, it will scare you. It is, I have to tell you, it is a violent book. Book. So my kids were only five and three when we read this, and there were some scary scenes. I mean, there's some stuff in there that scared me. There's kidnapping and attempted murder. There is murder, uh, quite a few. It's intense. It is violent, but 
it'll point you back to Jesus over and over. There's like little devotionals at the end. And ultimately, I think the good outweighs the bad. So we this year are reading the second one. It's not, you don't have to read them consecutively, but we're reading the next one that he wrote, Bartholomew's Passage, and it is just as good. Literally in the first chapter, I was like cracking up laughing and then all of a sudden getting choked up as I realized what was probably to come. So fantastic stories. Just such a talented, such a talented writer. Moving on. We read Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. We are continuing on with that series a little bit more slowly because of Christmas right now. But I just wanted to share that I loved these books when I was a kid and like all of the homemaker type stuff in them. So I wasn't sure if my kids would enjoy them or not. But these books, especially the first especially the first, totally for boys. Like there is adventure, there is danger, there is just general manliness and challenges and family protection and just all, and, and provision. I, I could go on and on. I was shocked and it is absolutely for boys. So I just wanted to share that. We also read our first YWAM, YWAM book. We read Hudson Taylor, Deep in the Heart of China by, I don't know how you say their names either, Jeanette and Jeff Benji. I always want to combine his name and say George <laughs> when I'm reading it quickly. We did this one as part of our school lessons. Is it, I think it's not consumed. I bought these from and also bought some like curriculum stuff to go with it where we do a little bit more of a deep dive into each of the missionaries and whatnot. So thoroughly enjoyed that. It was great. I love, it's very open and go type of a deal, but his story is so cool. We all really enjoyed uh, learning about Hudson Taylor and I can't wait to learn about other missionaries too. I'm really looking forward to that. Finally, I just want to share one more Jeanette Oaks Animal Friends series. These were super cute. They're short chapters, but there's quite maybe, I don't know, I would guess maybe like 20 chapters in a book. Um, so you could drag it out a while, but the chapters are only like a page or two. So we ended up reading each of these books, like one whole book in one night and it took probably about 45 minutes to read one of these books but they were adorable and would be great for somebody who's first getting into read alouds to do it just by chapter or maybe like a couple chapters per night instead of the whole book obviously but because they were short it would be great for that and they're just super wholesome and christian and cute little animals and all that good stuff, all the good stuff. All right, my seventh chapter I'm calling With Thad. <laughs> uh, I We've been reading the same book forever though. We are reading Dr. Dobson's Nightlight devotional. I can't tell you how many times we've read the first week of that devotional, but I'm trying to be more uh, disciplined and actually read the whole thing because I have a list of other books I would like to read with him. We, we typically only will read a little bit of it though when we're like on a date in the car by ourselves is the most common time that we do that. And he's in medic school right now, so it's not happening very often. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see next year if we've moved on to a new book or not. Probably not. All right, finally, my last chapter I'm going to call Picture Books. I have a whole highlight on Instagram of the picture books that I just love, but I wanted to share one that we finally bought this year and read, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures Jr. by Kristen Jensen. It's a simple plan to protect young minds, and it teaches, it's a very gentle introduction to pornography. 
not to pornography, but to the dangers of it and to teaching your kids that word and um, just to be aware that there are bad pictures out there and that it's okay to tell you if they see it. It just gives them the language and the tools to know what to do because the average age of introduction is now like eight years old. So definitely you want to be the one to uh, teach your kids about it before they discover it and somebody else teaches them about it. So those were my 2023 books. I hope that one of these books piqued your interest and that you want to add it to your Goodreads list right now. And hopefully yours is as long as mine, your TBR list, because reading's good for you. And I think there's a lot to learn in loving God and raising kids who like each other and love God. And yeah, it's late. So I'm going to go to bed. Have a happy new year, everyone.